the topic I would like to address is the relevance of what uh, historians do for educators. Most of you here are in the field of education and I'm an historian by profession as you just heard the, the chairman of this session. And the title I gave to this uh, presentation is uh, The Dialectics Between Denial and Uniqueness. Um, and I would like also to link what I'm going to say to what you heard this morning from Professor Benedict and from Professor Lip Wippermann, because I believe that uh, ordinary people do not read textbooks, and I believe that ordinary people do not go to medical schools where they are, they are taught how to treat uh, handicapped uh, in, in, in hospitals. And ordinary people, also in Germany in the 30s, drink Coca-Cola and go to the movies and uh, watch the movies made by uh, those who then were popular, I guess, Betty Davies and, uh, and other names that uh, today we, we, most of us uh, forgot. And if educators would present German society in the 30s as a highly ideologized society, where people read textbooks on the treatment of, of the handicapped, or were interested in biology and social Darwinism, this will convert our topic in totally irrelevant for the 21st century. Because the student in class will say, I'm not concerned about all these things. Nowadays, the society is different. We watch football, we watch soccer, we are not reading all these weird texts that Germans used to read there in the 30s. So we can study that as we study any other weird society in, uh, in, in, in Java in the 14th century or something like that. And this is not what we want to achieve. We would like to see the relevance of what went on in Germany in the 30s to the reality of the 15, 16, 17 year old teenager nowadays. I think that the assumption that German society then was highly ideologized is based on a, on a uh, improper understanding of the dynamics of an ordinary society. It's based on the continuity or, or on the spell of the thesis of Hannah Arendt on the one hand, that the society, a democratic society collapsed and is now completely controlled by propaganda or is under the spell of the movies made by Leni Riefenstahl, in which you see uh, hundreds of thousands of, of, of Germans saluting with the Sieg Heil, and this is what was German society. So if this was true, that German society in the 30s was millions or 60 million people saluting Sieg Heil in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, in mass demonstrations, reading weird textbooks on biology, uh, 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 being immersed in more weird textbooks on, on the treatment of, of handicapped. So all this is totally irrelevant to us. And I think that the opposite is the true. German society in the 30s was an ordinary society. Those who went to medical school definitely read those books relevant to their studies. And those who were, went to study biology definitely 
learned what was relevant to their studies. And in those years, those who went to medical school learned about the extermination of, of segments in society that are a problem. And this was not weird, this was more or less normative, not only among right-wing uh, uh, um, seg uh, sectors, but also in, uh, among people who were, I would say, close to, to a, a more leftist, humanistic uh, view of society, that also there when you read them at the beginning of the century even, you can, say, you can see that uh, they suggest the physical elimination of people who cannot function, who, who are addicts, who are junkies, who, who, are, who are alcoholics, and uh, the, the idea of exterminating people with gas was even proposed by people who were not Nazis and by, by some who were not even German. So it was not weird in those circles to do this. But this has nothing to do with ordinary society. Ordinary society never, never was interested in all these things. And this is the problem that the Nazis had. We are going now to do something which has never been done to solve the Jewish question. They never said we are going to solve the Zigeuner Frage. Because the Zigeuner Frage was not a universal, the, the, the gypsy question was not a universal problem throughout, throughout the centuries. But the Jewish question was a universal problem throughout the centuries. Since those statements of, of, of what you call St. John, and later on throughout the centuries by, uh, by other uh, theologians. This was a crucial issue in, in, in Western civilization. And the Nazis said, we are going to solve this once and forever. And this will become a unique, a unique deed. But ha had German society been weird, they would have accepted that statement of the Nazis. But since these people were ordinary Germans, how do you transfer to ordinary Germans that you are going to solve once and forever the Jewish question? So what you do is you do not transfer it. Neither will you transfer it when, it, uh, when, when you approach the non-Germans, which means the, the uh, ordinary population in, in, in the rest of the world. Uh, this thesis that I have, I would like to give some empirical evidence. Um, let's take the deportations of the Jews that started in 1941. So by August 1941, it is clear that Hitler approved the idea of sending the Jews to the East in wartime. As we can read for, I'm not going now to quote what are the documents that, that, that attest to this. And indeed, on, the, on, on September the 1st, 1941, it was uh, Yom, Yom Kippur, uh, the, uh, the leaders of the Jewish community in Berlin were called by phone and they were informed that the deportations will, will start very soon. And on the 18th of October 1941, the first train started rolling to Lodz. Eichmann commissioned four special trains on which he packed some 4,000 Jews and sent them to the, to the new uh, ghetto uh, established in, 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 in Lodz. Now, how were people taken to these uh, trains from the Grunewald station? Again, all this is documented. Uh, the Jews that were, uh, those 4,000 and something Jews in Berlin that were given these, this order of transportation were assembled in a collecting point in one of the big synagogues that were, was not destroyed in the Kristallnacht on the Levitzerstrasse. And those who could walk simply walked. Those who couldn't walk because they were old, or they were sick, or they were children, so they were put on trucks and they were taken to that train station. And those who could walk were taken, uh, uh, were, uh, were, were taken by, by, on, by foot 
uh, almost seven kilometers from that synagogue to the, uh, to the train station and from there sent to Lodz. And then we read the diary of the Minister of Propaganda that refers to that operation of the deportation of the Jews to the East, saying what? Saying, what can I do now? People don't understand. People don't understand what we are doing. People don't understand the need that we, the Nazis, have in doing this unprecedented thing. So what would be our reaction to the fact that they don't understand? We are not going to force them to understand. We simply are not going to address the topic. And whoever will talk about this, if he is a journalist stationed in Berlin, his uh, identity card as a, state, uh, as a journalist will be revoked and sent back to, to where he came from. This is a topic on which you do not talk. And that's it. And this is how this topic will be addressed throughout the rest of the months. People see, because you see those thousands of, 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 of Jews walking in the streets, but you don't talk about it, because the Nazis don't want you to talk about it. You take the declaration of the Allies of December 1942. Now also taking an event that everybody knows about it. And again, the Allies on the 17th of December, unanimously in Washington, in, 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 uh, in, in Moscow, in, in London, declared that the Jews of Europe are being exterminated. And then you look at the response of the Nazis to that declaration. How did the Ministry of Propaganda respond to that declaration? It did not respond to that declaration. And then you look at the speech given by Hitler, because 17th of December is almost the end of the year by the nature of things, and Hitler always gives a speech for the new year, summarizing the events of the last year, or informing what will be the achievements of the next year, and so on, and you look there in the text, what, how did Hitler address that, that event that is now announced by the, by the Allies that the Jews of Europe are being exterminated, and he doesn't address that event. It, it never happened from the point of view of the Nazis. It's not in the propaganda, it's not in the press, it's not said by, by Goebbels, it's not said by Hitler. Why? Because again, when you read the text, what Goebbels says, how can I explain what I am doing, what we are doing? The unprecedented character of that extermination, what he calls the evacuation, is something that ordinary people will not understand. Those ordinary people who watch movies and drink Coca-Cola, not the weird people who read texts about how to exterminate handicapped, but ordinary guys, they will never understand. And how can I now start arguing with them that the, the, the Allies maintain in their declaration that two and a half million Jews have been exterminated already. And another five million uh, uh, are expecting the same fate in the future. And I cannot start now discussing with, the, with, with, with them, with that declaration, saying, no, no, it's not 2.5 million that we have exterminated. As a matter of fact, we have only exterminated 2.3 million. This is what he writes in his diary. And since I don't want to convert this into a topic that I say 2.3 million, and they say 2.5 million, and people will not understand what is going on, this topic is not to be discussed. We are not going to respond to it. So let the Allies say whatever they want. We are not going to, to respond to it. And this was a policy that the Nazis adopted throughout the execution of the final solution. You do not talk about what you are doing, because people will not understand you. You film what you are doing. 
All the testimonies that we have indicate that on these execution pits in, in the east, you had the teams taking pictures and filming the executions. By cameraman appointed by the, by, the, by the Ministry of Propaganda. Special units were doing that job. What for, if you're not going to talk about it? Why do you do that? You do that because in the future, you'll have to explain what happened. Because this thing called the Jews that will disappear, we are going to bring a final solution, as we said, to the Jewish question, says, say, say the Nazis. But this will raise a question in the future, because people will read about the existence of that phenomenon called the Jews when they read Lope de Vega, and when they read Shakespeare, and when they read the Bible, or whatever they read, or when they go to a museum, they say pictures. Jews will be seen, because they are part, an integral part, a part and parcel of the Western civilization. And they will ask questions. So where are these Jews? What happened to that extinct race? And for that purpose, we need the, the pictures. And for that, we, 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 we sent these teams to, to take movies. And this is, as I say, documented by the statement of Goebbels himself. And this is more or less the, 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 the gist of what a, a Himmler says in 1943 in his famous uh, speech, his notorious speech in, in Posen. What we are doing now will take with us to the grave. This is, a glorious, uh, this is a glorious page in our history. But people don't understand this. And this is something that we, we must, we must uh, learn. That whenever the Nazis came to that junction, that they were convinced that they wanted to do something because they believe in it. But they were also convinced that the world will not understand it because it's still chained by the values of the Western civilization or by Christianity. And perhaps even the Germans, the ordinary Germans themselves, will not understand it. What do you do in, in, in such a moment? In such a moment, you yield. You do not become a fanatic and you, and you compel people to accept what you are doing. But you yield. And this is why, when, uh, when you read the... the, the the conversations between Hitler and, 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 and Horthy, let's say. And Horthy in Hungary says, I don't want to give you my Jews. You want to kill them? Okay, that's your problem. I'm not going to give you my Jews. What do you do then if you're a Nazi? You yield, you don't take the Jews. And even when you are in a conversation with your ally, Mr. Antonescu, and by September 1942, you were supposed to take the Romanian Jews to Belgium and gas them. And at that moment, Antonescu, for his reasons, it doesn't matter now why, says, I'm not giving you my Jews. You want to kill them? Okay, but I'm not giving you my Jews. What happens in that moment? In that moment, you yield. You don't take by force those Jews. You not, do not depose Antonescu, and, 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 you let it, and, 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 and you let Antonescu have his Jews till the end. And I think this is a very important uh, uh, lesson that we learn, that a... Uh, this could happen precisely because we are not talking about a bunch of fanatics who were only ideologists, who were obsessed with the Jewish question. They said, by hook or by crook, we are going to do it. And if nobody likes it, so we're going to, to, to force them to accept it. And it is exactly the opposite. They knew to be fanatics. They knew to be ideologists, but they also knew how to be a politician. We are talking about a criminal regime that has a, cer a certain criminal conception on how to solve a, a question. In their case, it's the criminal regime that had a certain conception how to solve the Jewish question. And it will be done, and it can be done, because they, they uh, uh, do not force people to accept it. What they force people is to, not to applaud what you are doing, but to keep silent when you are doing what you are doing and wait for the right opportunity to do it when the opposition of the so-called bystanders will not be so, so relevant. This is why by 1942, as, as we said, the press is full 
in, in the world of the declarations of the Allies, and the Nazis don't, don't respond. They're not interested in responding, in uh, having a, an argument with Washington, with London, or to, with Moscow, what is happening to the Jews. And in 1944, when you read the, uh, the, the protocols of, the so-called protocols of Auschwitz, when uh, 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 two Jews who had escaped from, uh, from Auschwitz uh, uh, informed the world on what was happening in that extermination center, and in June 1944, again, the world press, especially in the neutral countries, especially in Switzerland, is full with, with details on what is going on in Auschwitz. What do you do at that moment if you are a Nazi? Do you argue with Mr. Verba and with Mr. Wetzler and say, no, this is not so? You don't argue, you don't say anything. You just continue with what you're doing. And let people think if what you're doing is what is really happening or not. This is the way criminal regimes act. And this is why what happened then is relevant for today. Thank you very much.